Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship here in Glendermott today. And if you're visiting with us, but you're a very special welcome. And we're delighted to have those who are joining us by means of live stream, DVD and CD and the YouTube channel. Uh, Oscar Spence is occupying our pulpit today and we'll, we, we look forward to hearing what you have in the conclusion of Psalm 40, which we started last week. Uh, Oscar, so again, uh, you're very welcome. Food share available in the hall after the service and, and everyone is encouraged to join us for a cup of tea and coffee and a wee bun or a biscuit after, after the service today in the hall. Now next week I'm planning to strip the floor in the main hall to varnish of it and re-varnish it so again there'll be limited activity in, in that hall and I'll have to see what it's like at the end of the week so Youth Club are the only organisation who's back at the minute but they've been told that they, they maybe could use the upper hall and do something appropriate up there so um, there'll be less little, little activity on that floor for a couple of days anyway and then I'll see what it's like at the end of the week to see if we're going to have our tea and coffee there next week or not. Um, the organisations will be coming back shortly um, and we're going to start the announcement sheet from next week so if you have a date for your organisation starting back again please let Edward Austin or Stephen Hubbard know and uh, we'll get the the, the sheet up and running again and have it going right through to the, the end of the session again. I have an announcement here from Gideon UK. They're having a Friends evening in the Mahramisen Presbyterian Church Hall on Friday the 1st of September at 8pm and again everybody's welcome to that. I have a, a death associated with our congregation. Um, it's actually the brother of Mrs Lorna Smith. His name's Jim Smallwoods. Jim passed away at the tail end of the week there and is getting buried today. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Smallwoods family, uh, like an extended family circle at this time. Thank you. Well, thank you, George. Uh, it's good to be back again this week. And even some people came back, George. So I mustn't have did too bad last week. Good morning, everybody. That's, that's a good one today. It must be because you're getting rid of me. <laughs> Do you know, it's wet outside, isn't it? And I have that feeling. You know that feeling when the kids are going back to school? I always get it too, and I'm sure some of the kids get it too, and it's, oh, I see somebody holding their head down there. But it's that feeling that, that another year is going to begin, another running around and doing all these things and another state of busyness. And apparently it's summertime, today and look it's getting colder isn't it the nights are getting shorter again but you know things change things move on but God is still the same our God is still the same our Jesus is still the same he doesn't change and I want to read to you from the book of Nahum it says the Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble he knows those who take refuge in him and today, if we take refuge in the Lord, He is our stronghold. He knows us personally. And no matter what we're going through, no matter what faces us in this, this time to come, God is with us. God is with you. God is with me. And so, we come this morning to worship this great God and to praise His holy name as we sing together the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we echo the great hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. For you indeed are a holy God. You are a God who rules in authority and power. You're a God who rules over the land and the air and the seas. You are the God who created all men and all things. And we come before you this morning as your people. People that have been welcomed in through the blood of Jesus. Welcomed into the very presence of God through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Into the presence of of a holy God made righteous through Christ. And so we come to praise your name and to echo with all heaven as we cry out, holy, holy, holy. Lord, we are in awe of you. We are in awe of a God who is beyond comprehension. And yet, we know how much you love me. We know how much you love each person here. You are a God who is good. You're a God who is kind and loves his people. Gives his people his best. But yet we don't always respond with the same love. We often sin and go against you. We often do things that cause you heartache and pain. So forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for the things that we've done, the things that we've said, the thoughts that we've had. Forgive us for the people that we've hurt. Forgive us when we rebel against you and go our own way, just like sheep without a shepherd. And help us to always come back with the power of the Holy Spirit, always strive to walk in tandem with you. With the help of the Holy Spirit, help us to stand against temptation. Now we pray using the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. This morning, we're going to continue on as we look together at Psalm 40. If you have your Bibles there, can I encourage you to please open it up? So we're going to read from Psalm 40. I'm going to read to you for the entire chapter again, but we're going to look at the next part uh, of the psalm, the next few verses later on in the service. So this is Psalm 40. This is God's Word. This is a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside from false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written in my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and of your saving help. I do not conceal your love. 
and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For the troubles without surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, ah, ah, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. We know that God will bless the reading of his word. I'm going to ask the kids to come forward now. Can you just come forward to the front, please? Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, one person. We'll try that again. Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, here we go. That's good. Well, do you know what's happening next week? No? You go back to school. Are you as happy? No. No? Are the parents happy? Well, I'll let you into a secret. I'm not happy. I like to get my brood around me and I like the summer holidays. And I always get that feeling when I go back to school as if I am going back to school. Do you know that thing you get? Well, yeah. So, but it'll be okay. It'll be okay. I'm going to ask you now, can some of you tell me some people that help you? Can we think of anybody that helps us? Over here in the end. Your parents, that's a great one. That's amazing. Hold on to that one. Teachers, Teachers help you. Anybody? Would you, were you going to answer? No? No? Granddads. Granddads help us. Anybody else help us? Any bright ideas? Definitely not me. <laughs> yes. God. God helps us. Yes. But out here as well, what some of the, the adults shout out. Jesus. Jesus helps us, that's right. Oh, we're on a roll here. Any of the adults shout it. Who helps us? We're not too sure. Well, when you are sick, who helps us? Go for this one. Parents, yeah. A doctor or a nurse, that's right, helps us. Or when you... Well, this is a terrible thing. If we were to get lost or somebody stole something from us, who would help us? 999. 999, the police, you're right. And then there's somebody else that helps us too. If your car gets broken down, who helps you? An engineer or a... What are you going to say? A mechanic. Is that what we're thinking of? A mechanic. Well, I'm going to tell you a story. One day, my car broke down in Bishop Street over the city, just outside the... The AA, that's right, not the EAA. I don't know who they are, but the AA. And I broke... Yep. Yep, there you go. So anyway, I broke down and I lifted my phone because I was with the AA. And I rung them up and I said, how, how are you doing? I am parked in Londonderry. Could you please help me? And the girl was English, and she says, yes, what part of Belfast is that? Are you kidding me? No, no. And I said, no, I says, I'm not in Belfast. I'm in Londonderry. Is that not in Belfast? And I said, no, it's not in Belfast. And then she said, right, how close is it to Belfast? Okay. 
And I said, well, only about 90 odd miles away. So then she asked me for the number plate of my car. You know, the letters and the numbers in the front of me. And I said to her, I give her the number plate. And she said, that's not a number plate. I says, well, I'm afraid it's a number plate on my car. Oh, no. She says, that's not a valid number plate. Is it a special number plate? And I said, no. And I said, right, that is a number plate that's in Northern Ireland. I'm in Northern Ireland. I'm in Londonderry that isn't in Belfast, in a car in Bishop Street. And can you please send me a mechanic? So eventually she got it all together. And within maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, a mechanic came. And the ironic thing was he was just from around the corner. But sometimes when we need help, it's really difficult to find it. There's all these people all around us, and maybe they do help us. But sometimes it's hard for us to ask for help. Or sometimes when we ask for help, it's hard for people to listen, to actually get what we need. If you go to your teacher, maybe she doesn't understand that, you know, you you need help. But the thing is, maybe she thinks that you're not trying hard enough. Or maybe your mom and your dad, they're really busy and they're trying to do something and you're looking for help with something. (laughs) And you're trying to, somebody's going to have a long day at home. Oh my God. (laughs) There's going to be very quietness and dinner. So the thing is, it's hard to ask for help. And sometimes it's hard to get help. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we're talking today about this man. His name was David. He was a king. Is that right? And everybody around him had, had turned against him. Everybody around him hated him. Some people wanted to kill him. And he had nowhere to ask help from. So what he did, listen, what he did was he asked God for help. Now, how would you ask God for help? Pray. Pray, Pray. yes. Pray. So prayer is the way we talk to God. Do you know, prayer is just talking to God. And even you at school, if you go back, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, prayer is the way we talk to God. Now, Often when you go to ring somebody nowadays, you'll sit for a long time on the phone, won't you? If all the adults know about that, we'll sit for maybe minutes, yeah, minutes and minutes and minutes and nearly an hour sometimes. But the thing is that God's helpline is open 24-7. That means every day. It means that God doesn't go on holidays. That's right. It means God doesn't go on holidays. It means that God doesn't listen. It means he always listens. Yes, that's, that's it. Thank you for putting me right. So, the thing is that God is always just at the end of a prayer. And maybe the adults need to hear that as well. Because no matter what you face, no matter what you're going through, no matter what comes up against you, no matter where you find yourself, remember this. God is always just at the end of a prayer. Now, thank you so much for answering no, no. Thank you so much for answering. Thanks for coming up. George, have you got the important sweets? <gasps> wow. Yeah. There we go. Do you know, this is one of the few churches that gives sweets to their kids, and I end up having to carry boxes of sweets with me everywhere, but seeing George is always armed, I, I just let him batter on. So, right. Do you just want to get a sweet and head back to your thing? Our Back to your ch- your your pew. Sorry. Our car is on with traffic. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I'm sure it's good. Right. So we're going to praise God once again in song as we sing together. One more step along the world, I go.
we continue to worship God now as your offering and tithes will be received. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. And we pray that they will be used to glorify your name. Amen. going to pray now and we're going to pray for our world and it's a world that needs prayer doesn't it because when we look around us the world seems to be on fire the world seems to be full of violence and so we need to bring these things before God so let us pray our heavenly father we know that you're a God that listens to your people And so we pray about these various things and we lift them up to you this morning. And we pray that you will hear us and hear our prayers and that you will act with mercy upon them. We remember this morning the wildfires that burn across northeastern Greece. We think of everyone who who is affected. We think of those who have lost their homes We think of those who have lost loved ones. We remember the families of the 20 people who were killed. We think of the firefighters who are risking their lives to contain this blaze. We pray for the 60 injured firefighters that have been hurt already. Lord, we just pray that the winds would abate, that this dry land that's on fire, that you would quench it. And that no more harm nor damage would be done. That no more life would be lost. We pray for people afterwards that have to put their lives back together again. Lord, we turn to Iran. We pray for those who feel oppressed and those who protest against the Iranian government. Those who long to be free from religious laws. We especially pray for women and young people. We pray for those that have been arrested who have stood up against the government and is imprisoned. We pray for all the families of those who have been executed already by by quite a, a difficult, hard law. Heavenly Father, we pray for the 1.2 million Christians that live in Iran. People who are persecuted who meet together in house churches and are afraid because of their faith. We pray for those Christians who are excluded from education, who are discriminated against in employment. 
We pray for women and young girls. Lord, see your people and help them in this country. Help them to stay close to you and remember that you are the rock of their salvation and their fortress. Heavenly Father, we pray for our young people as they return back to school. Remember those who have had their examination results over the summertime and are moving on to further education or university. Help them as they take these next steps of their life. But we also pause to pray for young people and children who didn't get the exam results that they expected. Those young people who struggle with education, young people with special needs, young people with learning difficulties, Father, they too need your help. So whatever the situation, put people in their path that will help them, that will support them, that will stay beside them. We pray for global missionary. We pray for Steve and Rose Kennedy as they work in Romania. We ask that you would bless their witness and their work there with newly arrived Ukrainians. Help them to settle these people into the community. Help them to provide for their needs. Help them in anything that is needed. We remember the Reverend Stephen and Valerie at this time. We pray that you would bless him as he is in holidays. And so we think of the congregation. We pray for all who are sick. We pray for those who are in hospitals. Those who are contained in their houses and housebound those who are in nursing homes. We pray for anyone in this congregation that is facing trouble. We ask that you would be there, that you would be a prayer away, that they would turn to you and put their troubles and cast them to you. We pray for the bereaved. We especially remember the, the Smallwoods family this morning. And we ask that you be with them on this day. And Lord, as the church reopens again and starts many different outreaches and organizations, we, we pray for this meeting house here, this congregation, for the BB, for the GB, for the youth club, for the food saving ministry that they put on, for the, the Presbyter Presbyterian Women's Association. We pray for all these things, these organizations within the church that labor all year to glorify your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to worship God again together as we sing now, Speak, O Lord.
I was just saying to the choir that I was in a church once and it was very, very warm and I took off my jacket. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. And the elder looked at me. He says, oh, you're taking your jacket off. And I thought maybe that he thought I was dressed inappropriately or something. And I says, no, no. I says, it's just very hot. I hope I don't, didn't offend you in any way. And he said, oh, no, no. It's just when our man takes his jacket off, he doesn't know when to sit down. So, folks, I have to warn you, I have the jacket off and I have the sleeves rolled up, so I, I hope the, the steak's not going to get burnt today. Now, the last week I was here, we looked at the first 10 verses of Psalm 40. And as I explained back then, just a quick recap, that these are two very distinctive parts of this psalm. The first part, it's attributed to David, this psalm. The first part is a, a psalm of praise. But then David, he moves into a lament, a cry for help before the Lord. And some people would believe that this psalm is prophetic. It points to Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. In the first 10 verses, David, he offered up his praise. He worshiped the Lord despite all his troubles he faced. He gave thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness. And David, he was clear that he was attributing his deliverance, his help, the answer to all his problems, to God alone. There's been much discussion about the way that these verses have been put in order. And some Bible commentators, they've drawn their readers' attention to the argument that this psalm could have been put the wrong way around. People could be forgiven for thinking that the second section of the psalm should be at the beginning. That the second section reveals to us why David was writing this psalm. And it does. We read David's motivation in his verses in 11 and 12. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me for troubles without Number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. His troubles, his sins were more than the hairs on his head. Now, for some people, that would be maybe more than others. But think about it. David was being totally honest before God. His troubles had surrounded him. His sins had overtaken him. And these sins were so numerous, they were so, so many of them, that he likened them to the very hairs on his head. And when I read this psalm, I see a broken man. A broken man who's overwhelmed by life, who's weighed down by sin. David, he cried out for help to God. He cried out. He was being completely real with God. He was being completely honest with God. David's world had crashed down around his ears and he knew that his only deliverance, his only hope, the only answer to his situation would come from God alone. And it's the same for us, folks. Our hope is placed in our God. He is our deliverance. Firstly, David was a man who was stressed. The only thing holding him together was his faith in God because he remembered how God had answered his prayers in the past, how God had saved him so many times. You know, a medical website reported in 2023 that one in 14 adults in the United Kingdom are suffering from stress. 7% feel stressed every day. And the Mental Health Foundation uh, from figures from YouGov stated that 74% of people feel so stressed that they feel overwhelmed or unable to cope. 51% of adults who felt stressed reported feeling depressed. And 61% of people reported that they felt anxious. And sadly, 37% of adults who reported feeling stress also felt lonely. For those experiencing stress, 16% had self-harmed and 32% said that they had experienced suicidal thoughts and feelings. 
Folks, we live in a very lonely and stressful world where there's lots of people out there who are hurting. Maybe in this congregation, in this meeting house today, there are people here that have their Sunday face on, but they're hurting inside. Stress is really real. It's really real. It's a problem in the United Kingdom. And mental health problems are real in the United Kingdom today. More and more people are becoming overwhelmed, just like David was. And more and more people need to turn to God, just like David did. Several people feel that mental health provision is not able to cope with the demands placed on it. The resources are being stretched and stretched. There are thousands of people today with mental health problems and they need help. They need help and they're stuck in a system. And some get help and while others are stuck there on waiting lists and assessment lists, others feel that the help they get is too little, too late. Northern Ireland, many people were deeply affected by 30 years of violence and murder and maybe people in this congregation as well. We're all affected in some way by murder and bombings. Yet organizations like Victim Support are cutting spending to help victims of the troubles here in Northern Ireland. The survivors of the troubles are being left to get on with it by themselves. Our God doesn't leave us to get on with it. The newsletter recently wrote a story about the decline of faith in Northern Ireland. Based on the findings of the last census, Protestant denominations saw their numbers fall from comparative figures 10 years ago. The newsletter argued that these numbers show that people from Protestant backgrounds are much more likely to say that they are non-religious people. People have lost sight of God in our island. Many have nothing to believe in, nowhere to go and nowhere to turn to when they face the feelings of hopelessness that surround them, the troubles that mount as many as the hairs on their head. But in contrast, David had something that he could hold on to. He had faith and he had someone to turn to. God, because he had the gift of faith and he placed that faith in the Lord God Almighty. According to the University of Toronto, researchers that were looking into the human brain, they believed that non-believers work differently under stress than people of faith. Compared to non-believers, people who have faith show significantly reduced levels of activity in their brain that these levels of the things that cause anxiety. Why? Because we can cast our cares on to the Lord. David had two sources of stress that overwhelmed him. He wrote, my sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. Sometimes we find ourselves victims of our own mistakes, folks. Victims of our own actions. Victims of our own sin. David, he was a man of faith. But he too struggled, just like every one of us in this meeting house struggles with sin. David's sinful nature on occasion after occasion caused him to fall. And we ought to remember that David was just flesh and blood, just like you and I. He fought with his flesh. He fought with his sinful nature just the same way that we too fight every day with being a human with being a human being. And we do what comes natural to us. That's our sinful nature. The Apostle Paul, he wrote these words to believers. Now, this is one of these Bible verses that is a tongue twister. It's hard to get out. And I don't know if I've ever read it properly, but you'll get the, the, the gist. So Paul wrote this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. You're getting it so far? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me, the sin in him, causing him to do the things that he doesn't want to do. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. 
That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I cannot carry it out. And we can't carry out our desires to be good. The only thing that can help us is the power of God living within us. David's sinful actions and choices had caught up with him. And when we, when we sometimes come to a, a junction, our sin catches up to us as well. You see, sin hurts people. We get hurt and other people get hurt often when we sin. Lies hurt people. Violence hurts people. Greed hurts people. Lust hurts people. There's no such thing as a victimless sin. We even find ourselves victims of our own sin. And David, he lusted after Bathsheba. We all know the story. As he spied on her bathing upon the roof, he coveted another man's wife. He had relations with her and she became pregnant. And in an attempt to cover up, he lied to Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, and had him murdered. The first child of his union with Bathsheba became ill. The child later died. David sat by his bedside day after day, night after night. And folks, this one sin by David led him into a chain reaction of sin and events that not only hurt him, but hurt other people. This is what sin does to us. The book of Norman, uh, book of uh, numbers warns you will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. David was also faced with enemies, enemies who conspired against him to ruin him. Verse 14, may all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. On one hand, David's sins had caught up with him. And on the other hand, he was surrounded by people who hated him. David still wasn't hopeless. When all this was going around, David still wasn't hopeless because God was with him. God's grace was with him. God's love was with him. God loved David despite his sin. And God loves you and I today despite our sins. And he longs for us to come back into a relationship with him. And so David was called to repent. And so we are called to repent. We are called to ask Jesus to forgive our sins and enter back into this loving union with God again. And secondly, when a person is so overwhelmed by sin, it can be attributed to one of two things. The devil is trying to accuse the person in order to make them feel so terrible that they're afraid to turn to God. That's the first thing. Satan literally can be translated into accuser or deceiver. The devil seeks to accuse us and deceive us. He wants to make us feel so bad and ashamed by our sin that we are afraid to turn to God, that we're embarrassed to come before God that we will not turn to the Lord Jesus for help. That we will not feel good enough to turn to God. That we will think that our relationship with God and Jesus is destroyed. He's been doing this from the beginning of time. And he's very good at it. In the Garden of Eden, he did it to Adam and Eve. Satan tempted them and he deceived them. He caused the first man and woman to sin. And Adam and Eve were so overwhelmed by their, their feelings of guilt. And they were so ashamed that they hid from God. I wonder, do you ever hide from God as well? Are you hiding from God? The devil wants you and me to feel so ashamed that we will hide away from the very person that can help us. He wants us to feel so ashamed and forsaken that we will be totally destroyed and feel that we have nowhere to go and no one to turn to. When we face trials and problems, he wants to pour them on our head. And the devil wants you and I to feel separated from God. He wants us to feel forsaken by God. Well, can I encourage you today that because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we will never be forsaken. You see, Jesus knew what it was like to be human. 
He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be tempted. He knew what it was like to be separated from God by sin. And Psalm 40 is, as I said before, perhaps a prophetic message because many believe it describes Jesus' feelings of despair and separation from God the Father when he, Jesus, the sinless one, became sin himself as he was crucified on the cross. The devil wants to destroy our relationship with God the Father. But Jesus, on the other hand, he wants to restore our relationship. He wants you and I to come back to God. Because of Jesus' love and grace, it's so big, it covers our sin. We are hidden. We are hidden in Christ. And therefore, when our sins come against us, we don't need to be ashamed of them because Christ has dealt with them on the cross. If we truly repent, if we turn to him, then he has dealt with them. Our sins are dealt with if we place our faith in Jesus and ask him to forgive us our sins. Now the second reason that can cause problems is that we're not actually aware of our sin. We're not convinced. You see, the Holy Spirit can convict us of our sins and our need to repent, to say sorry to God. And God has this gift of forgiveness waiting for us. But the Holy Spirit, unlike the, the devil, convicts us to bring us closer to God through Jesus Christ's grace and authority to be forgiven. Sometimes we're brought so low that the only place is up. Have you ever felt like that? That you've been brought so low that the only place is up. And the only person that we can turn to is Jesus. You see, David, he understood. He understood that amidst all his troubles that he could still turn to God for help. And so this is where we see these very two distinctive sections of the Psalm 40 connect. David wrote in the opening verses, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. David understood that this is why he was able to write this, that that God was the one who lifted him. God was the one who had forgiven him. God was the one who gave him hope. In Psalm 46, we read, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And Psalm 40 is based on the Exodus story, Exodus 34, 5 to 7, where Moses wrote the Ten Commandments onto two stone tablets, and the Lord came and he moved through the Hebrew camp. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord is good. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. This is our God. David understood God's love. He realized that instead of running away from God, that he should run to God. And the Holy Spirit, he convicted David of his sins, that the sins were all around him, the chaos that was all around him. And this is the good news that we also have, that we share with David, that God is a compassionate God. He is a God full of love. He is a God of mercy and grace when we repent and turn to him. You see, sin no longer has the power to separate us from God because when we ask Jesus to forgive our sins, we are made into new people by the power of God. Our sins are forgiven. And therefore, the devil has no authority over us anymore because we become part of the body of Christ. We are Christ's people, Christ's church. But that doesn't stop the devil trying to deceive us. Tell us that we are too sinful to turn away from Jesus or not to ask for his help. Satan still wants to keep us his prisoner. A Japanese soldier on the island of Guam fled into a cave in 1944. 
rather than surrender to the American army, he hid in that cave for 28 years, only coming out at night and surviving by eating frogs and rats and snails and shrimp, nuts and mangoes. His very clothing had rotted away, and he had made clothing out of tree bark. The war was long over for everyone else. Everyone had gone home. There was peace. It was restored. But for this Japanese soldier, the war lasted another 28 years. He could have been enjoying life. He could have been living out in the sunshine. But instead, he was hiding in a cave and skulking around in the dark because he was afraid. You see, some people are afraid to approach God. Some people are afraid to come out into his light. And there's a barrier between them and God. Even some who profess to love God and call themselves Christians are afraid to approach God and feel inadequate before God because they're not living a life the way that God would have them live. Instead, they're wasting away and hiding in the darkness, just like that Japanese soldier. They're wasting their lives because they know the things that they should do, but they can't do them. And they think that they're not pleasing God. If you have ever responded to God's love and feel overwhelmed by sin, it's time to run to Jesus, not run away from him. It's time to ask him to deal with your sins. It's time to ask for his forgiveness. Folks, if faith has become stale with you, then it's time to run to Jesus. It's time to ask for his forgiveness. It's time to ask for his help. It's time to go to Jesus. If we profess to love Jesus, but our words and actions aren't as they should do, then it's time to run to Jesus. It's time to ask for his help. It's time to ask for his forgiveness. And if we feel overwhelmed by life and sin, it's time to run to Jesus. It's not the time to hide away from him. David wrote, but many, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. And let that be our desire this morning, our goal in life. People who proactively look for God in situations because our help to deal with whatever comes isn't found in ourselves. Our help comes from the Holy Spirit within us who sanctifies us and leads us each day. And let's echo with David when we say together, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. Will you do that for me this week? Will you turn to Jesus, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're doing, no matter if sin overwhelms you, then turn to Jesus. Amen. Our final hymn together, we sing, uh, we sing, let not but through Christ be me, in me.
the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.